In 1820, Schubert was 23 years old, and on the professional side of life, things were looking rather positive. In that year, there were 14 performances of his works for musical theatre. In 1821, Schubert was finally accepted as a member of the most important musical organization in Vienna, the Gesellschaft der Musikfreunde, the Musikverein, something he had bitterly been denied three years earlier. His name was becoming known among music lovers in Vienna, and he moved into a room at Wipplinger Straße, living independently for the first time in his life and composing in peace. However, the powers of Schubert's darker sides would soon reverse his success. He was starting to be impatient and rude to his friends and associates. He started behaving badly in public spaces, embarrassing his friends, often under the influence of too much alcohol. In 1822, Joseph von Spaun, who had helped and supported Schubert financially for many years, writes, to Franz Schober. It cuts me to the soul that Schubert has drifted away from me. That same year, Schubert composed the first two movements of a new symphony, a symphony he would never finish. It would become one of his most beloved works, of course named the Unfinished Symphony. The unfinished symphony starts with this melody in the basses and celli in unison. It's dark, it's mysterious, it signals to listeners that here starts a tragic musical tale to be told. When Schubert wrote this symphony, he was only months away from contracting syphilis. And after that, his life would never be the same again. And it's almost like the darkness of that beginning is a foreboding of what destiny had in waiting for him. It is also interesting that from this moment his music would also change. One of his most famous pieces is the Trout Quintet, which is a piece that was composed in Steyr during one of his visits there. The first time he visited was in 1819, the second in 1824. And there is no absolute evidence that he wrote that quintet during his first visit, but it is generally thought that he did. Why? Well, this is a happy piece of music, full of energy, that embraces life, and to me it seems impossible that he would write such a piece in 1824, one and a half year into his sickness. Now let's be clear, I am not saying that a composer living a tragic life for the moment, being depressed, cannot write a very happy piece. That is, that is absolutely possible and something Beethoven often did, for example. But the tone of the music, the underlying character, is something that simply does not fit with what Schubert was composing, starting with the unfinished symphony and onwards until his death. This period sees a maturity and a mastery of larger forms that we have not seen before. That means that from here on he writes the great masterpieces in chamber music, like, for example, the piano trios, the late piano sonatas and the two last symphonies. The unfinished symphony and also the ninth, which is called not by Schubert himself, but it is called the great. As mentioned, during this time, Schubert started to behave pretty badly towards his friends. There are scholars that argue that Schubert's behavior points towards him being manic depressive. And I think there is, a cer there is certainly a strong possibility that was true. Not least, having these two sides of his personality, one being the creative, cultured, almost snobbish person who was 
quite intolerant of people not sharing his high level of knowledge of art. And then the other side with his excessive drinking, smoking both tobacco and maybe even opium and engaging in highly risky sexual activities, which gave him the syphilis that certainly shortened his life and being, and, you know, being manic depressive could also partly explain his almost manic creativity and productivity during certain periods. It should also be said that it's pretty clear that our dear Franz Schober came back to Vienna during this time and seemed to really have had a bad influence on Schubert's way of life. Let's talk about this incredible symphony a bit. When a composer sets himself to write a symphony or a string quartet or a sonata, perhaps his biggest challenge is <clears throat> to write a single movement of, say, 20 minutes that creates one musical shape from first note to last. And that musical shape has to create its own beauty. Compare it to a church with many beautiful things in it, windows with arch, maybe a painting up in the ceiling, and all kinds of beautiful decorations. But for the church to be beautiful, these things which are all fantastic separately, have to be arranged in a way that when you take two steps back and look at it all together, the whole scenery of the church has to have its own beauty. For composers, unlike painters, for example, this shape is made in time, which makes it more elusive and harder to grasp. And I think all composers find this a great challenge. When you see Beethoven's sketches and how he takes away bars and erases passages, many of those changes are about just that, finding the right balance of the piece, that things happen in an order and in a way that makes this whole shape being beautiful. And in all honesty, that is not really a problem. You have to fight with too much in a three-minute song, whether you are Franz Schubert or Lady Gaga. In the beginning of the unfinished, there is this melody in the basis, right? And it's completely by itself, with no accompaniment. What happens next is that Schubert starts exactly that, an accompaniment, which by itself is so intense, it's the perfect follow-up to that beginning. And it sets the stage for that amazing melody in the woodwinds. So the sounds build up, builds up almost like a staircase, first the basses, then the middle sections with the violins, and then the oboe and clarinet. And it creates this beautiful musical shape that things happen, that creates a flow that in itself has value and beauty. The last thing I want to mention is the ending. Here, Schubert re returns to the mysterious theme of the beginning and then starts to expand it to the violin and it spreads through to the whole orchestra with some beautiful harmonies put behind it. And so this is something new and the same time the music comes to a full circle. He knots everything together in a beautiful musical shape in time.
Schubert was described by friends as below average height, thick but not overweight, and round-shouldered. His hair was thin and curly, he had a snub nose, and his lips were pursed up. Joseph von Spahn wrote about Schubert that one could hardly call Schubert handsome, but when he spoke pleasantly, his features were full of charm. Schubert seemed to be shy and rather uninterested in public praise, small talk and gossip, and he was impatient with conventional conversations. He was interested in all kinds of arts, he wrote his own poems, and in his letters one can detect an interest in both history and architecture. His brother Karl was actually a landscape painter. During this period, Schubert reached a level of maturity in many genres, not least in chamber music. While he was not so skilled in the art of socializing, he still befriended many high-class musicians, something that undoubtedly inspired him to compose for them. Far gone were the days when he played the viola in a quartet with his family members in a classroom in his father's school. Now he could write music for some of the most prominent virtuosos in Vienna. When Schubert contracted syphilis, he was 25, and it changed his life forever. Today, it's a disease that can easily be treated with antibiotics, but in the beginning of the 19th century, the mortality rate of syphilis was high. Until his death, Schubert's life alternated between periods of relatively good health, followed by periods of sickness. In a poem by Schubert himself, dated the 8th of May, 1823, when he surely had gone through months of severe symptoms, he wrote, See abused in dust and mire, scorched by agonizing fire. I, in torture, go my way, nearing doom's destructive day. In Schubert's body of work, there is one genre that is not really present. There is no real solo concerto, meaning a three-movement work for a soloist with an orchestra. Beethoven did it, Mozart did it, why didn't Schubert? One reason that Schubert did not write concertos was that he himself was not a piano virtuoso and he wouldn't be able to play a brilliant piano concerto by himself. Another was that concertos would mostly be played at a public concert. And you would be surprised to know that in Vienna during this time, most concerts were not public. They were private events, not open to the general public. And the shift from the situation where going to a concert was a matter of status and social privilege to being a matter of just buying a ticket. And this shift happened during the 19th century is actually an incredibly interesting story which had a huge impact on music history and music itself and instruments and halls and everything. But let's stick to Schubert. As we heard, Schubert had by now many friends who were virtuosos on their instruments. But instead of writing solo concertos for them, Schubert seemed to be much more comfortable writing chamber music for them. So a lot of Schubert's chamber music is technically brilliant and very difficult. Both piano trio starts very powerful and you could say orchestral actually. Schubert's most famous songs and his most famous melodies have put sometimes a stamp on him as someone who is cozy and always writes these beautiful intimate melodies. But we shouldn't put Schubert in that cage. And his chamber music is the most powerful example of how diverse and dynamic Schubert could be. The music can be elegant and melodic, yes, but it can also be dark. It can, as, they, as in the incredible quartet movement in C minor, be threatening and demonic. In this episode, you will have the pleasure to listen to three wonderful young musicians and we are presenting two pieces of chamber music which we have, because of the COVID situation, recorded and filmed separately. Not listening to each other in the same room, 
but being in different places and even different countries, sending music files back and forth to each other. It was very difficult, but honestly, I could never believe this would come out as incredibly well as it did. So I am so proud to share this episode with other musicians, despite the COVID situation, and I want you to enjoy something which was written for an instrument that is not in use anymore, which was called the arpeggione. Nowadays, the sonata is being played instead mostly on a cello or a vi viola. And I thought that the viola was just perfect, because that was the instrument Schubert preferred to play when he played himself in a string quartet. The viola does not have the same brilliance as a violin, and it doesn't have the same deep singing sound that a cello has. And maybe that is why I think that the viola is the instrument that comes closest to the human voice. So enjoy listening to the instrument that was the favorite instrument of both Mozart and Schubert.
On March 26th, 1827, Ludwig van Beethoven died. Three days later, his funeral drew at least 10,000 people following his coffin through the streets of Vienna. There was a long line of torchbearers following the coffin that carried the master to his grave, and Schubert was one of them. As a young man, Schubert told his friends, secretly, I still hope to be able to make something of myself, but who can do anything new after Beethoven? Exactly one year later, on the day, one of the most important events in Schubert's life took place. It was his first and only public concert dedicated to his music. It took place in the hall of the Gesellschaft der Musikfreunde, which was in the building of a restaurant called Zum Roten Igel. The city was at this time in the middle of a craze for the violin virtuoso, Niccolo Paganini, who performed 14 concerts in Vienna, and Schubert attended two of them, being dazzled by the diabolic playing of the Italian violinist. The newspapers were full of reports of Paganini's playing, and no spot was available to review Schubert's concert. But, by all accounts, it seems to have been a success not least financially. After the concert, Schubert wrote to his friend Bauenfeldt, urging him to join him to hear Paganini. I tell you, we shall never see someone like this again, and I have stacks of money now. Schubert's concert was a mix of songs and instrumental works. The longest composition of the evening was a piano trio in E-flat, played by three of Schubert's friends. The selection of this piano trio as the most important work of the evening tells us how much this piece meant to Schubert himself. The year 1828 would be Franz Schubert's last. As late as in September of that year, he composed an incredible amount of music, including some of his best work like the three last piano sonatas and the beautiful string quintet.
Schubert certainly knew that syphilis would shorten his life. But at that point, he must have been completely unaware of how little time he had left to live. As autumn went on, Schubert felt increasingly sick. His doctor advised him to move in with his brother Ferdinand, who could arrange for his care. On October 31, his brother tells the story of how Schubert fell sick for the last time. He was about to eat fish, but threw down his knife and fork on the plate, claiming that eating made him feel like he had been poisoned. And after that, he hardly ate anything but medicines. On the 20th of November, Schubert's father ordered 150 copies of a statement that started like this. Yesterday, Wednesday, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, fell asleep to wake to a better life, my most dearly beloved son, Franz Schubert, musical artist and composer in the 32nd year of his life. While Beethoven's funeral had masses coming out on the streets, Schubert's funeral was attended only by his family and friends. In Vienna during these, this time, funerals had three classes, first, second and third. Schubert received the second class, which was still a step better than Mozart, who got third class and therefore was buried in more or less a mass grave. What did Schubert die of? It's hard to say, and there is no clear consensus on this, except for the fact that there are several possibilities. It could be that he entered the last stage of syphilis, it could be that he had typhoid fever, or it could be both. And how did doctors treat syphilis in those days? With a bath in mercury. Can you imagine? So, basically, if the syphilis did not kill you, the treatment for it would. The music we just listened to. Did you know that this music was inspired by a Swedish song? In 1827, a young Swedish tenor called Isaac Albert Berg visited Vienna and he sang at a private house concert where Schubert was in the audience. There, one of the things that Isaac Berg sang was a short song called Se Solen Schunker, which would translate as See the Sun is Setting. Before we talk, about this song, I want you to hear it. I looked for versions online, but the only version I found was a German tenor trying to sing it in Swedish. And yeah, I don't want to be mean. I'm sure I would not sound too authentic in a language that I don't know, but it sounded a little bit like the Swedish chef in The Muppet Show. So I am not a singer, which you will hear, but I will try to sing this in Swedish for you. So enjoy or not. Sie solen schunker ner bak höga bergens topp för nattens dystra skuggor du 
flir usena hop forfel forfel ak vennen glömde bort sin tugna vena bryd i sprit i faithful pride i sprit There are three things in this song that found their way into Schubert's trio. We have the piano accompaniment of chords. We have this slide upwards and down. Giving the melody a bit of an emotional outbreak, which is really beautiful. And then we have the most interesting and in my view, the most important element, which is the falling octave. In the trio, there is exactly that octave, with the echo and everything. But not only that, this simple motif is everywhere, just a little changed. As in the more sweet sounding second theme, for example, as you can hear here. That falling two note thing is played again and again and there are many more sequences like that. Now I want you to pay attention to the word in the Swedish song when those two notes are played or sung. It's the word farvel which means goodbye. Did that have any significance to Schubert? At this point in life he had one more year to live although obviously he did not know that but he had been living with a deadly disease for almost five years by now. To me, this whole movement starts in the character of a funeral march. And the music feels highly personal. Is this goodbye something that is close to Schubert and is somewhat a reference to his life and his situation? We cannot know this. That is the mystery and the beauty of music. We cannot be sure of anything. This journey with Franz Schubert and his music is coming to an end. There are so many things that we didn't talk about. The last piano sonatas, the Winterreise, the operas, and many personal things. But I have tried to focus on the things that I believe I should talk about and also the things that I really want to talk about. It has been an incredible amount of work, but all the reactions I have received from you guys watching has inspired me and really kept me going. So thank you everyone who has been with me. And of course, we should all thank Franz Schubert, who never got the appreciation he deserved during his lifetime. But after his death, has given millions and millions of people beauty, strong emotions, comfort, moments of joy, and so much more with his music. Despite being poor, despite being sick, he devoted his life to writing beautiful music. And for that, we are truly, eternally grateful.